Is the derby picture coming more into focus or getting more muddied? Let's talk about it on this episode of the Win Play Show. Salutations and welcome, friends. I'm your host to this episode of the Win Play Show. My name is Matthew DeSantis, and you can find me on Twitter at the handle at fail to menace. And I want to say welcome to the win play show, a program devoted to all aspects of horse racing and handicapping that is proudly part of the trust the profits YouTube network. Now, before we go any further, make sure to press that subscribe button for trust the profits as we got you covered wall to wall as we enter into the derby season and all things horse racing, whether it's winning your in races for the Breeders' Cup already, whether it's just graded stakes races and previews, whether it's the derby picture whether it's Thursday night lounges at Charlestown or uh, Turfway Park, a lot of fun in those lounge on Thursday nights. So no matter what you're into on horse racing, we got you covered here on Trust the Profits. Okay. Uh, now, also make sure to give this video a like and let me know what was your big takeaway from this weekend at the fairgrounds. What was your biggest takeaway from those Huge 13 races that we saw on Saturday at the fairgrounds, of course, headlined by the grade two risen star. Well, what we're going to do this week is we're going to run down a lot about that fairgrounds meet, but we're also going to talk about some other important horse racing news. And then we're going to finally conclude by talking about what we have coming up in the future week. Well, let's kick it off by talking about that fairgrounds card and what was an extraordinarily chalky day at fairgrounds. Uh, and that was one where if you watched my episode of the Wind Play show, I always try to give you a price. And prices were not really coming up on the winners <laughs> in the winner circle. It was incredible to see how chalky it was, incredibly favorite driven and favorite heavy, even in maiden special weight races. That's where I'm always going to get crushed. If you just start giving me chalk in maiden special weight races, tough to win there because a lot of times I try to look past the winner in maiden races because a lot of times there might be some warts there and a lot of times with first out, you just don't know what you're going to get sometimes. And so a lot of times I tend to move towards a price in a maiden special weight race, but it was tough. Uh, you know, race two, I think was the best example of this. The horse comparative by Brad Cox goes off at three to five. Oh, the horse had lost by a combined 13 and a half lengths the last two times that it completed a race. And the other time it didn't complete a race, it lost its rider. Going off at three to five favorite. I can't swallow that. Guess what? The horse wins by eight lengths. Okay, fine. So, you know, it's just, it's one of those days where it was really tough. The first seven races, horses that were two to one or lower won every single one of the first seven races. 10 of the 13 races on the entire card were won by horses at five to two or lower. Eight of them were favorites. Two were virtual favorites, where it was kind of a tie between them and another horse, but, you know, with the same odds, but the other horse might have had just a little bit more money in the win pool and was therefore slightly a favorite. But I mean, it was, it was very favored heavy. The good news is if you watch cap, uh, capping the card, uh, uh, thank God for Dennington uh, in, the, in the one optional claiming race, because that really saved my back. And amazingly, if you had just done a flat $2 win bet on all of my value plays, you would have gotten 261 back, which I, I don't know how that ended up working out. But like I said, thank God for Dennington. Thank God for Pioneer of Medina. Those were some winners that we hit on. Unfortunately, my top picks didn't do as well, but still did manage to connect with two pretty nice exacta boxes on the day. So let's talk about those. And I should also say a special thank you again to Joe Christofek, who came on the show for capping the card from Fairgrounds. Joe gave out a couple of other winners on top of what I gave out. I gave about five winners on the card. He gave out two others, uh, two Emmys. And he actually talked about Angel of Empire and the Risen Star that we're going to get to in a second. So hopefully everybody at least survived Saturday at the Fairgrounds. Didn't do too bad. Uh, but let's talk about the big races. Well, one of the maiden races that was really big was uh, the race in which Bishop's Bay for Brad Cox won. And this was a race that I talked about where very few of the participants in the race had any prior experience. It was basically a bunch of first timers out. Uh, the half to Jackie's warrior was in this race. Uh, there was a lot of horses with big pedigree in this race, none bigger than Cox's Bishop Bay. And this horse records a 97 buyer speed figure on debut. Wow. Uh, that was a huge number, particularly for this three-year-old crop, particularly for a non-Baffert horse, quite frankly, in this three-year-old crop. 
you just don't see high 90s being run by anybody else in this crop right now. And we're going to get to that a little bit later. But it is interesting to me that it does seem, when we talk about the Derby picture, it seems to me that potentially the best horses from this three-year-old group are not in the Derby picture at all right now. And that they're just maturing a little bit late. That a lot of the best horses might be a little bit of late bloomers in this field. You have a horse like Bishop's Bay that you have to say, wow, when they rub post a 97 in debut. You got a horse we talked about last week, Kings Barnes. Okay, now Kings Barnes is, for Todd Pletcher probably is going to end up uh, running in the Tampa Bay Derby. But, I mean, this is a horse, only two career races now going into a Derby prep race. Uh, you have a horse like Arthur's Ride, who just broke his maiden down at Gulfstream Park a couple weeks ago. That's another horse that looks like he's going to just keep getting better. So there are these there are these three-year-old Colts that are just coming out of the woodwork now who might end up being very important horses as we talk over the summer, maybe up in Saratoga or later this year down at Gulfstream Park as four-year-olds. I mean, you never know. So it's very fascinating to see how this three-year-old crop has kind of evolved uh, from the very precocious juveniles to some new shooters on the scene to now you're getting these kind of entrance that people are getting very excited about and wanting to rush onto the derby trail but it's you know it's going to be like a one prep and then maybe go that's a tough task we saw that last year with dave uh with taba of winning a maiden then going to the santa anita derby then going to the kentucky derby that's tough to do on any horse so uh but bishop's bay huge win there for brad cox uh, and a really impressive maiden debut I want to talk about a little bit of the horse and Gaston, who nearly pulled off just a huge upset in the Colonel Power Stakes, which was uh, the turf sprint later in the card. This is a horse that had been off for well over a year and had only run one time in the last three years. And yet he manages to almost put it all together, almost get the win. He was my top pick. I was rooting for him coming down the stretch. Ultimately, Evan Singh, who drew into the field because of a scratch, uh, ended up winning that race. And it was kind of bittersweet for me because Evan Singh, was my top pick the last time he was supposed to run. Uh, but he scratched out of that race because it went off the turf and was run on dirt. Evan Singh's a horse I really like a lot. So when he when I saw he was going to be in the field, I was a little bummed because I knew he was going to be bet down as the favorite, and he was, uh, because everybody was at, at Fairgrounds on Saturday. And Angaston ended up coming in second. But, I mean, what an effort. What an effort. You can only hope that Angaston is healthy and back and is came out of this race in good shape and can continue to run uh, for a few more races and a few more years potentially uh, because he really put in a heck of an effort. Great ride by uh, Mitchell Morrill. And so it was uh, really, like I said, a, a, an awesome thing to see this horse that had barely run it all in three years, almost win a stakes race. Uh, very cool. I was really, really, I was using a lot of body English to try to yeah, uh, let's try to, you know, let's try to push him into the winner's circle. Let's try to get him across the line. But ultimately, Evan Singh, who is a horse I like a lot, and I think a very good horse, won that race. Well, let's get to the optional claiming race that was on the card and talk a little bit about it, because this was one that I even billed as having Kentucky Derby implications because a first defender for Steve Asmussen, because of banishing for Brendan Walsh. These were horses that a lot of people were very high on. Banishing was a horse that had scratched out of the LeCompte undercard and now has come back here. And a lot of people were very, very high on Banishing, who ran a huge figure, breaking his maiden, I think posted a 90 buyer speed figure. First defender posted a big buyer speed figure first time out. But as we got closer to that race, I felt better and better about my picks of Cayostro and Dennington. And I'll tell you why. First of all, I've never been a huge ban a banishing supporter. I I've never thought that horse was as good as that speed figure was last time out. Um, and then first defender's form was not flattered in the maiden special weight races leading up to it. Because two of the horses that first defender ran against last time out when he broke his maiden, Kigali and uh, Quaternion, those two horses came back and ran nothing. They ran middle of the pack to back of the pack in two other maiden special weight races earlier on the card. So suddenly I'm looking at that first defender race and going, who did this horse really beat? And was there anybody else that was really worth it in that race? Because that race is not coming back strong initially. So ultimately the race played out kind of the way I thought it might, which was there was going to be a little, little bit of speed up front. And I thought Kyostro and Dennington would kind of sit the right trips and Dennington getting Lasix for the first time. That's a winning move for Ken McPeak, his trainer, uh, ultimately tracks down and gets Kyostro at the you know last few strides. 
And Kyostro, I thought, was a really good horse that was far better than his buyer speed figures indicated on that last race. And I thought would really like the two turns as well. And he did. He ran great. But here's the thing. I don't think this race has any Kentucky Derby implications now. Dennington I hadn't really shown much in graded stakes races before this. And here's an important factor. Kenny McPeak off Lasix, moving a horse off Lasix, 5% winning. Two for 41. I got to thank David Aragona, uh, past guest on Capping the Card, for that information. He posted about this on off Lasix uh, by trainer. That was really fascinating. McPeak is terrible when taking horses back off Lasix after being on it. And so really something noticeable that when Dennington goes back and tries to run maybe in the Louisiana Derby, I, you know, I'm not going to have a lot of confidence that 91 buyer speed figure. I don't know if he'll be able to back that up off LASIK. So it's, it's interesting, uh, I think to see there. So, uh, very, very intriguing race, but like I said, I don't see it having derby implications the way that we thought it might have derby implications, particularly for first defender in that race. I do think Kyostra is a really nice horse. I think first defender is a really nice horse. I think banishing is a good horse. I just don't think banishing is maybe as good as we saw in that maiden special weight, but Interesting race. Tappet Shoes. I know there's a lot of people who uh, I follow on social media like Tappet Shoes, finished third. Uh, that horse, I don't know if that horse ever gets the right trip. Um, I'm also not sure if that's the right configuration, a, a one turn race, a two turn race. It's interesting to see with Tappet Shoes what they would like to do with this horse. Well, let's move to some of the stakes races on the card. Let's talk about that Mineshaft stakes. <laughs> what a finish, right? Between Ma Pioneer, Medina, and Mr. Wireless. I was really rooting for Mr. Wireless, who I had as my top pick the last two times out. The last two times out, he's lost by less than a head uh, and combined. And I mean, he was right there uh, last time out with Happy American. He was right there this time out with Pioneer Medina. Just could not get past. But hey, my type of horse. Always a hard-running second-place horse. Uh, always one of my favorites. But Pioneer Medina, I thought, ran really well. Recorded the highest buyer speed figure of the day at fairgrounds posted a 99 buyer speed figure and in some ways really salvaged what was looking to be a rather weak Harlan's holiday field. That was of course the race he had run in previously. And that race, I made the point on capping the card, despite me liking Pioneer Medina, that was a race that had not come back super strong as both Skippy Longstocking who won that race and simplification who finished third in that race ran absolutely nothing in the grade one Pegasus. Now you can say, Hey, listen, it's a grade one Pegasus and Pioneer Medina is going to another grade three in the mine shaft. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Totally right about that. That said, that grade one Pegasus was not the strongest grade one we've seen. Uh, and so I just thought, eh, Skippy and simplification didn't run really well, but Pioneer Medina had a few more weeks off to rest up. And I, I, I was confident the horse would run well. And I particularly against that field. So I think a really Interesting horse. I like Pioneer Medina a lot. And so I think this is a horse that will have something to say in our handicap division moving forward over the next few months. I think this is, he's going to, I don't want to say be a major player, but I think now with him and charge it, a horse that's back on the workout tab, I should mention after his victory, after a very long layoff, he's back on the work tab. I think those two provide a little bit of excitement, at least for what could be uh, maybe a decent division uh, or a salvageable division uh, coming up. The fairgrounds turf, uh, you know, that was a interesting race watching them run on the fairgrounds turf, weaving all around, trying to go to that far outside, which is where you want to be because the rail is so dead. Uh, two Emmys though puts them to sleep up front. I mean, this that's what I was afraid was going to happen. Um, I ultimately went with gentle soul Two Emmys though was, you know, I just thought maybe there would be a little bit more pace. Uh, maybe there would be a little bit more pressure on two Emmys, but 25 51 up front. I know what, Joe said about you got to sometimes translate what 2551 means at fairgrounds versus other turf tracks. He's right, but two Emmys just no pressure at all. And then had more than enough and just pulled away from the field. I mean, it wasn't even close. Uh, a gentle soul finishes second. That's fine. But, uh, you know, the, the horse that probably got the worst trip was Tiz the Bomb, who was just kind of trapped inside the whole time. And that rail is just completely dead at fairgrounds. And so Brian Hernandez Jr. didn't really do him much favors having him stuck on the rail there. And not that. He, to some extent, he couldn't avoid it, but uh, it, it was tough because he had the inside post. And so it was a tough situation there between saving ground and being where you don't want to be because everybody swung super wide and ran down the outside of that turf track coming from home. So congrats to two Emmys, though. 
great effort there and a really cool horse. I, I like two Emmys a lot as a horse. Uh, always puts in a really good effort. Seems to like that fairgrounds course. Uh, I, I just, I like horses like two Emmys a lot. Um, let's talk about the Rachel Alexandra because this was one where sometimes you're right and wrong in the same race, right? It, it happens all the time. I told you, I don't like Hoosier Philly. I, I didn't trust the horse. I didn't trust the horse at all. Hoosier Philly was going off at 11 to one in Kentucky Derby futures. Get the H E double hockey sticks out of here. Okay. Come on. Are you kidding me? 11 to one on Kentucky Derby futures. I admit this is not a strong Derby crop, but come on. This horse had barely cracked an 80 buyer speed figure. This horse is not that fast. I hate to break that to you. Okay. We finally saw that by the way, on Saturday for the world to see, um, I just didn't, I didn't understand the enthusiasm around this horse to some extent, the cult of personality that had developed around this horse. And one of the things I always talk about is what happens when things don't go right, right for a horse. And that's what happened with Hoosier Philly. And that's why going back to last year, I liked a horse like simplification because when he blew the break at the Holy Bull, he, he managed to completely adapt his running style on the spur of the moment and finished a hard driving second after being dead last. Okay. And spotting the field six lengths. All right. That's why I like a horse like giant mischief this year who blew the break at the springboard mile and then ran like a freight train coming home to get second place in that race. Okay. That's why I like horses like that horses that you go something bad happened or something happened. What I didn't intend. I didn't get the perfect trip and guess what? I can overcome that to, have a good result. Who's your Phillies had three fantastic trips and had three fantastic races comes back as a three-year-old. First of all, coming off a layoff and you know, you're going to be rusty. Sometimes that happens to the best horses. Who's your Philly comes back from layoff bobbles at the start. Now here's the thing. It's the six horse field people. Okay. Now I know what the people said. She wasn't able to get clear. True, she was uncomfortable, I would say, throughout that first turn for sure. And into the back stretch, she just was kind of boxed in and just not in the greatest spot. That said, she was more than clear turning around the third and fourth turn coming for home and just had nothing. And you could say it wore, you know, trying to you know catch up from the, the back wore out, but everybody was within three, four lengths of each other. I mean, that was not a strung out field. She was not having to, you know, it, this was not Zenyatta trying to, you know, circle the field and come up short. You know, she was not that far off the pace and made a move and then just flattened out and didn't have anything else. Meanwhile, Miracle almost pulls it off. Shout out to Kevin Kilroy, who was on doubling down, uh, was Colin Sheehan's guest from the fairgrounds. That was his pick. Uh, it was Miracle. And I, I, I gave a long look at Miracle as being the lone speed in the race. And I thought maybe this horse is able to get away up front and it's just able to do it. Um, ultimately pretty mischievous. Uh, it sits kind of a nice stalking trip, tracks him down and, and, and tracks her down and wins. And so suddenly pretty mischievous, pretty much so shoo-in now for the Kentucky Oaks field. Uh, and so, and, and potentially even Miracle being a, uh, maybe a shoo-in for the field, depending on how the points figure out. So I, I think a really interesting race there. Chop, chop. Now we talk about who's your Philly, who finished third, but was well beaten third. And listen, I think that Philly is going to come back next time and run a much better race. But I think it, it did say something. One of the things I mentioned on capping the card with Joe was, I wonder what happens. And I said it the way, I wonder what happens when she gets looked in the eye by another horse. And, but it, it relates to what I just brought up. I wonder what happens when things don't go perfect. And that's what we saw. What when things don't go perfect, she's still a young, inexperienced horse and things just, you know, kind of didn't go her way. That happens. And it's okay. But 11 to one on the Kentucky Derby futures is insane. And I'll just say that. Uh, I don't care how weak this derby field looks. That's still nuts. Um, and, and anybody betting that horse at 11 to one, just please stop, stop doing that. Save your money, please. Um, now in terms of a bad performance, chop, chop, wowzer was that bad. And that's one where, you know, that was my top pick. So, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll flagellate myself for that one. Um, the blinkers coming on chop, chop is interesting. Looking back on it, that should I should have been skeptical of that. And I also think, and far be it for me to question Brad Cox, but I don't know if this was the right spot to put blinkers on Chop Chop. Because in a six-horse field, do you really need Chop Chop to be up on the lead? 
which is what ended up happening. And that's not what this horse wants to do. I understand this idea. This horse needs to be focused. This needs to horse needs to be maybe a little bit more forwardly placed, but in a six horse field that, like I said, was strung out by about three, four lengths, chop, chop could be sitting last and be fine. Now, if you were going into a 12 horse field, I'd want blinkers on this horse because I need that horse to be a little bit more focused, getting out and a little bit more forwardly placed. Doesn't need to be on the lead, but needs to not be dead last. Okay. But blinkers on in a small field. I just felt like maybe that's overkill. Um, I, I just, I didn't like it. I, you know, the more I thought about it, the more I didn't like it. And ultimately, like I said, moves the horse right up to a stalking position outside of Miracle and then just nothing down the stretch. And I was just, you know, it, it was just, it was over. And it was like, oh, that's not the horse. That's not the race this horse needs to run. So we'll see what happens with Chop Chop, who I do think is a talented filly, but I just don't think that was the right setup, right equipment, right scenario. I don't know. I don't know what to think of her because she's kind of turning in a little bit of an ABAB horse. Uh, so we'll see. Well, let's move to the headlining race, the Risen Star. And I feel a little bit good in that this race played out the way that I thought. Because uh, sometimes they break and you go, what, what is this? Uh, right? I mean, we've all had races like that where they break and you just go, why, why is this horse in the lead? Why, why is my horse not in anywhere near the lead that I thought was going to be in the lead? You know, that sort of thing. We've all had those moments. But ultimately, uh, it played out exactly as I thought. With determinedly, Harlow Cap and Victory Formation up front. Pushing an aggressive pace, 23 and 1, 47 and 2, victory formation strung out wide. Why victory formation went off at 2 to 1, no idea. Why Harlow Cap went off at 5 to 1, no idea. At least determinedly went off at like 38 to 1. That's about right. Um, I, you know, I don't see how you could look at this race and think victory formation had a good path to victory. Uh, I it just it just wasn't there. Now Listen, I'll be the first one to say, I didn't have Angel of Empire. Joe had Angel of Empire. I didn't have Angel of Empire. I had two fills who ran well. But the race broke down about the way I thought, which was it's going to be somebody coming from mid-pack or further back that's going to win this race. Because everybody in the front end is going to get burned up because they're running fast, and the horses that like to stalk are sticking close to a much faster pace than they might otherwise, so they're going to fall out. So... You know, Harlow Cap was the one who kind of, I guess, hung on the best. I think hung on for sixth, but everybody else from the top five, from Angel of Empire to Sun Thunder, from Two Fills, Tappet's Conquest, uh, and Single Ruler, all came running from the back. Okay, because everybody else just collapsed down the stretch, which speaks to distance limitations, I think, for this group and the pace of the race. Ultimately, Angel of Empire wins. This was a horse that I was absolutely using underneath. Joe had a rousing uh, recommendation for this horse that really kind of also persuaded me a little bit and, uh, you know, ran a hell of a race and took advantage of the pace scenario. Great ride by Luis Saez. Amazing effort there. It was a horse that was kind of an afterthought to victory formation in the Smarty Jones last time out, but had a strong gallop out and was a, was a horse that clearly wanted more and more distance. And so the nine furlongs worked perfectly. Ultimately, they'll record a rather slow speed figure, 87. Yeeks. Not great, especially compared to Bishop Bay, 97. <laughs> 10 points higher in maiden debut. So that wasn't great. Sun Thunder finishing second really screwed up a lot of people's tickets uh, because I, you know, I had two fills. I had I had basically three of the top four, but I just in my exacta, but I didn't have the second horse. That's a problem. Uh, and so Sun Thunder, though, bounced back from a great effort. And this is something I brought up. Uh, Colin Sheen and I talked about in the early look preview, if you watch that. And, and while I didn't pick Sun Th Thunder, so I'm not going to try to take credit for it, I did point out that was a horse that ran really bad in the slop at the Southwest last time. And you kind of had to, you had a feeling that maybe that was just draw a line through that one and look at the rest of this horse's form. But really a great effort there from uh, Sun Thunder. Two fills uh, coming in third. Two fills was interestingly the horse that was closest to the pace that finished the best. So early on was sitting more mid pack and ended up finishing third, but ultimately did flatten out a bit down the stretch. But two fills just feels like an honest horse. who's always going to just finish underneath. I just, you know, he's going to run well, I think in the Louisiana Derby, I think he's a shoe in to be in the starting gate at the, at the Kentucky Derby, but angel of empire barring any sort of physical setbacks is pretty much so guaranteed to be in that Kentucky Derby uh, with 50 points going to the winner. Tappet's conquest finishing fourth. I thought a nice run there was coming on late as well. My long shot croupy, oh, my guy, you got to start a little bit better. Just a terrible start, dead last. Uh, and, uh, you know, the pace helped and that croupy was picking him off at the end, but just, you know, gives himself a lot of 
to do every single time and gets himself into a lot of trouble. So I know Chuck Simon suggested this horse might be better at a one-turn Belmont type of track, and, and that might be true. A uh, big one-turn sweeping mile, maybe so. Uh, so we'll we'll see. But uh, a, a thrilling race nonetheless. So let's shift from Oaklawn, let's, or let's shift from Fairgrounds, talk a little bit about Oaklawn, the Razorback Handicap, which was won by Last Samurai, and I'll be honest, I'm a little stunned you got eight to one on this horse, uh, which is great if you bet last Samurai. This horse ran fourth at the Pegasus World Cup, which I it just said was not the strongest grade one, but still compared to the rest of this field was a pretty damn good grade one. And historically, it always run well at Oaklawn. And West Willpower, I thought, was a good horse, but let's not overstate how good of a horse is a horse that lost to Proxy uh, last time out at the Clark. And... What do we see Proxy do at the Pegasus World Cup? A whole lot of nothing. So I, I just wasn't that sold on West Willpower, who made a very unusual move. If you watch that race, it's rare to see a move like that coming out of the second turn already and was really hustled up with the leaders. And I, I mean, honestly, the only move that kind of reminds me of a little bit, and I'm this is not trying to compare this horse to the horse I'm about to name, but the very famous move that Secretariat made around the first turn at the Preakness when he just kind of decided I was going to lap the field right away. Uh, West Willpower kind of doesn't do the same thing, but kind of, you know, moves from middle pack to just like all of a sudden I'm going and I need to be up on the lead. I, I wonder how much of that contributed to the fact that he kind of flattened out down the stretch a little bit and what didn't have enough in the tank maybe to hold off last Samurai. Ultimately, Law Professor rated our superstar finish out the superfecta there, finishing third and fourth respectively. Uh, respectively. So uh, always like to see rated R at least get a piece. So let's head over to Japan. And there was a Kentucky Derby prep over there. The Hyacinth Stakes was a Kentucky Derby prep race. And if you watched the video on the YouTube channel here, Trust the Profits, and based upon the number of views, you didn't. It's okay. I don't hold it against you. But you got to start educating yourself a little bit more about Japanese racing. I'm just saying it's going to help you come Breeders' Cup time. You need to know about these Japanese horses a little bit more. Uh, I, just, I I give you a hard time. I just joke. But Hyacinth Stakes was really fascinating. The Kentucky Derby prep won by uh, Perrier, uh, who was the morning line favorite, or was the post-time favorite, I should say, even money post-time uh, favorite, and earned 30 Kentucky Derby points, which is pretty much so enough to guarantee a spot in the uh, starting gate if this horse wants to come over horse had a really nice late, uh, late kick and then pulled away late from the group uh so a uh, very nice effort there from the favorite but the horse that i really want to talk about was eclogyth eclogyth man i want this horse over here in america to run in sprint races that horse completely blows the break and then does what basically what i just described that secretariat did and just said you know something i'm in last place of 16 horses how do I feel about just lapping the entire field to get up to the lead? And he did that in what felt like about two seconds. And the most amazing part is he almost hold on, held on to win. Uh, he held on to third place. And I mean, he could be a really exciting sprinter, I think. Uh, if he ever decided to come over here to the United States, he's going to be an exciting sprinter, I think, over in Japan. But man, well, that was if, if you didn't watch that race. Go back on YouTube, find the try to find the replay of that race. That was something else. Or go to TVG and uh, you know, see the go into the race results and watch the replay of that one because that was wow, Eclogyth just flying uh early to just circle the entire field and then holding on for third. So that was pretty cool and earning Kentucky Derby points in the process. But then the big news over in Japan was the great one, February Stakes, which was of course a race that had the United States' own Cheryl's Spate running in it. Ultimately, this went to the morning line and post-time favorite Lemon Pop, who is the son of Lemon Drop Kid. Now moving to eight wins and 11 career starts. This is a Breeders' Cup win and you're in race. So Lemon Pop earns an invitation to the Breeders' Cup. And remember, with it being in Santa Anita this year, expect more Japanese horses to be entered. If you watched that Japanese stakes preview video, you hit the exact as well because Alex and I both liked Lemon Pop up top, which was not very creative, but I encouraged you to play Red Lazelle underneath. The Red Lazelle at eight to one comes in for second place. $10 exactly. You're not going to, you know, build a, a small fortune with that, but hey, it's better than not winning at all. So uh, Red Lazelle, though, with a nice late kick to finish second in that race. Cheryl Spate runs a, a decent race, finishes mid pack over there. Uh, but again, this is not her perf uh, you know, his preferred surface. This is a, you know, he's a turf horse and running on the dirt, like I said, not ideal. And it's important to note 
that many of the best Japanese horses are already over in Saudi Arabia for the upcoming week's Saudi Cup, uh, including Cafe Farah, who's largely considered one of the great Japanese horses. So this is a little bit more of a wide open February stakes than what you might see otherwise. Well, let's move to some other news that's around the track and let's go to the jockey news here and let's talk a little bit about Frankie Dettori Saturday out at Santa Anita. That's right. Four wins on the day for Frankie. So that was a really good day for him out there. I love seeing him succeed and thrive during this uh, kind of farewell tour that he's having. And amazingly, he is now five for 10 winning when running on the downhill turf course, 50% on the downhill turf course. That is a flat bet I will take now every single time. When I see Frankie up on a mount at the downhill turf course, I will just put blindly money on that horse because it's going to pay off. So that was really something else to see uh, his success. We also had a very somber moment over the weekend as a number of different tracks, as well as the uh, PDJF, recognized the memory of Avery Wiseman who is the jockey up at Fort Erie, who uh, sadly died of suicide uh, earlier this year. There was a moment of remembrance organized by First Racing and the PDJF for a, mo a moment of silence at Laurel, at Gulfstream, at Santa Anita, at Golden Gate. Uh, it, all the jockeys took that moment of silence. All of them wore armbands remembering Avery uh, in that on that day. And people around the track wearing those armbands too. I know Larry Colmas and Andy Biancone were also wearing it uh, on TVG. So... You know, it, it's never a fun topic to talk about, but it's a necessary one to talk about in terms of mental health awareness and the pressures that are put on professional athletes, particularly professional athletes, I would say, in sports that are hinged around betting, where people lose and gain small fortunes based upon how you as a jockey do in a particular race sometimes. That is incredibly, uh, I, I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine the pressure of that. I played high school golf and I thought that was a lot of pressure. I can't even imagine the pressure of being a professional jockey and knowing that if I messed up, I could have very easily lost people hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, that that's, it's a lot of pressure to be under. And so, and it's not only the, the betters, but your own sport and trying to move up in your own sport. And obviously the social media aspect of all this as well, people getting on social media, bashing jockeys, et cetera. So just a somber moment, uh, obviously to have the track, Maybe it's a moment of realization. It's a moment of clarity and perspective that we should have. But certainly, if you are if you or anyone you know are struggling with uh, mental health issues, please make sure to reach out uh, to those resources that are always available. Now, in some better news in terms of the jockey news, uh, Trevor McCarthy does look like he's close to returning. Remember, uh, had a nasty spill, broke his collarbone, uh, but he is back on the work uh, workout tab as well. Uh, you know, he's not a horse, but he's back on the work tab uh, and he's back on the track working out and on horseback. And so looks like he's going to be coming back pretty soon. We're happy to see that. Obviously wishing uh, Trevor the best of recoveries and the quickest of recoveries back onto the track. In trainer news, we got a lot of trainer news. Bob Baffert's injunction to prevent him from Entering horses at the Kentucky Derby has been tossed out by a judge. Uh, so it looks as if that February 28th deadline is going to be a hard and fast deadline for Baffert to transfer his horses to other barns so they will be eventually eligible for Kentucky Derby prep points. Now, this is something I'm just speculating. I personally think that there's actually not going to be many uh, Baffert transfers. Uh, Harlow Cap certainly has transferred to Asmussen's barn already. Uh, I think Arabian Night, there's a good chance that is going to get transferred. I know that uh, uh, regular listener, uh, gentleman on Twitter, Derby Path, always points out how close uh, Rudy Brissett worked with Arabian Night when he was at Oaklawn. So transferring to Brissett's barn might be something that you see there. I honestly don't know if Zidane is going to want his horses transferred out of Baffert's barn. I don't know if Baffert wants to let a horse like Hijazi out of his sight. I, I don't know. I, it'll be interesting to see, but I, I'm leaning towards less horses coming out of, or fewer horses coming out of Baffert's barn than more. That's just the way I think of it. Uh, we also had a couple of milestones. We had one. We might have another by the time you're watching this. But uh, Brad Cox reaching the 2,000th width of his career, obviously an astronomical growth uh, in his career accomplishing this in the better part of five years almost. Uh, and obviously a huge win there for uh, Brad Cox. Congratulations to him and his entire team. 
The other milestone that we are sitting on is Steve Asmussen getting that 10,000th win. Uh, I just watched Disarm get lost, uh, lose in the eighth race at Oaklawn right before recording this. So he's still stuck at 9,999. Presumably he will get that 10,000th win pretty soon. Uh, but it's just an incredible incredible number and an incredible achievement by a gentleman like Steve Asmussen who comes from a racing family. And, uh, you know, any, if you'll ever listen to him, he'll tell you that he's not the best horseman in his family and that's his brother and his dad. So it is, uh, amazing to see, uh, Steve Asmussen approach that milestone. Hopefully by the time you're watching this, maybe you've already passed it. Well, what do we have coming up this week? Well, we got a couple of really great shows coming up, obviously, on Capping the Car, doubling down with Colin Sheehan. We got more Derby prep contenders, but we're going to be focused on the Rebel Stakes, obviously, Oaklawn Park. That's going to be the big focus of the this week on Capping the Card and on doubling down. But never fear, we're also going to have a Saudi Cup Stakes preview, so make sure to tune in for that. Country Grammar, Taba, a lot of American interests, a lot of big-name horses in Europe and Japan and the United States running in that race. So make sure to check that out as well. Well, that's going to do it for me today. Make sure to subscribe to Trust the Profits on YouTube. Make sure to follow me on Twitter at the handle at Fail to Menace. Until next time, friends, my name is Matthew DeSantis, wishing you a great and profitable day at the races and reminding you that it's now post-time.